Hi, my name is Haseeb Jaffrey. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist or a heart rhythm specialist with Kettering Health Network. Today, for our health chat, we're gonna be talking about a very common heart rhythm problem called atrial fibrillation, living with an irregular heartbeat. I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me today. We're gonna to first start by reviewing what the normal heart electrical system looks like. Then we're gonna talk about a little bit what is atrial fibrillation. Once we have an understanding of what atrial fibrillation is, we'll talk about why it's so important to treat it in all aspects of it. Then we will review how we as cardiologists classify AFib, what symptoms you might feel if you have atrial fibrillation, how do we diagnose it, and what are the risk factors? And lastly, but most importantly, how do we treat it? So again, let's start by reviewing the normal cardiac conduction system. So this is a schematic of what a normal cardiac conduction system would look like. Imagine you're standing in front of somebody and this is their heart cut in half. You can see the electrical system starting in the top right chamber in our God-given pacemaker called the sinus node. That originates electrical activity 60 to 100 times a minute every single minute of your life. That electrical activity then makes its way down to the middle part of the heart called the AV node where it pauses momentarily and goes down to both the right and left sides of the heart. This is important because as the electricity passes, it allows the heart to beat. So again, just like your car, the battery helps the engine to go. This is the electrical activity, the battery to your heart. So now that we have an understanding of what normal rhythm is, now I'd like to transition and explain to you what atrial fibrillation is in very basic terms. And again, in this image, you can see in the top left chamber, a normal sinus rhythm originating in our God-given pacemaker, going down to the middle part of the heart, then down to both sides. These are nice, normal, coordinated, regular contractions. When somebody has atrial fibrillation, as you can see on the right slide, the God-given pacemaker, the sinus node, goes to sleep. And with atrial fibrillation, you get a chaotic, disorganized eruption of electrical activity from the top left chamber of the heart. And in fact, that chamber starts to contract or try to contract four to 600 times per minute because the electrical activity is just that fast. Luckily for us, not all of those electrical impulses make it down to the bottom chambers of the heart. Instead, what happens, you may get anywhere between 100 to 200 of those impulses that make it down. So you as a patient may feel palpitations, you may feel a fast, chaotic, disorganized heart rhythm. And that's what atrial fibrillation is. So again, this is just another schematic of the heart. Let me take you through the different panels of this. Panel A is similar to what I just showed you on the last slide. This is us looking from the front to the back on another human being, uh, what the heart looks like cut in half. If you were to take that from image A all the way through image E, imagine turning the heart around. So now we are focused squarely on the top left chamber of the heart, looking from the back to the front. And what you can see is there are four tubes coming into the top left chamber of the heart. These tubes are called pulmonary veins, or essentially vessels that come from the lungs that bring oxygenated blood back to the heart. And where these vessels touch down into the top left chamber of the heart, that, those connections are where you find those irritable cells that are the origination of atrial fibrillation. The image on the right is a 3D electroanatomic map that we make during a procedure called an ablation of your specific heart so that we can tell how many veins you have and what they look like. Generally, everybody has four veins, two from the right lung, two from the left lung, but everybody's anatomy is slightly different. So when you do have a procedure or if you have a procedure called an ablation, your physician will be able to map, up your, map out your anatomy exactly. A little bit more about atrial fibrillation. The reason also why it's so important is because it is the most common arrhythmia in the world. About five million people in our country have it, and over 35 million people around the world have it. Whether you're a man or a woman, your risk of developing atrial fibrillation throughout your lifetime is at about 25%. The other important thing to remember about atrial fibrillation is it's a disease of aging. 
Unfortunately, as you age, the risk for atrial fibrillation goes up. One in 25 people over the age of 60 have atrial fibrillation, and one in 10 people over the age of 80 have atrial fibrillation. So now that we've talked a little bit about what normal rhythm is, what atrial fibrillation is, let's talk about why atrial fibrillation is so very important to treat. One of the most important reasons is it increases the risk for stroke. If you remember, I said that the top left chamber of the heart tries to beat four to 600 times per minute, and that's physically impossible. Our hearts luckily cannot beat that fast. So rather than beating that rapidly, your heart just goes to standstill and it quivers. And so blood does not move around effectively. And if blood does not move effectively and stays in one place for too long, it can start to form blood clots. And unfortunately, as you can see in this image, those blood clots can go from the heart out to the brain and cause a stroke. In fact, people who have atrial fibrillation have a five times higher risk of having a stroke. And also, those strokes are usually more severe. In addition to the risk of stroke, there is an increased risk for something called congestive heart failure. When somebody has atrial fibrillation, imagine your heart is beating 120 to 150 beats per minute every minute for weeks on end. During this process, you have to remember your heart's a muscle like anything else. If you continue to beat that quickly for that long, your heart is gonna weaken over time. And instead of moving the fluid and blood forward to all your organs, that blood starts to move back into your lungs and you start to get short of breath. That's called congestive heart failure. Additionally, having atrial fibrillation has shown to increase the number of hospitalizations and the amount of cost on our healthcare system. So in addition to being a morbid problem for patients, it's a big problem for our healthcare system. Now that we've talked about why it's important to treat it, let's take a minute and talk about how electrophysiologists or heart rhythm specialists view atrial fibrillation. You may have heard from your physician the following terms, paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing persistent, or permanent. And they apply those to atrial fibrillation. And all I want you to know is those are usually designating units of time. Paroxysmal, all that means is somebody who has atrial fibrillation that comes and goes and lasts usually less than 48 hours at a time. If you have persistent atrial fibrillation, what that generally designates is that you have had atrial fibrillation for longer than a week or you need a procedure called a cardioversion or a shock to get you out of atrial fibrillation. Long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is someone who has atrial fibrillation for greater than a year. And finally, permanent atrial fibrillation is someone who has spoken to their physician, they've gone through all the treatment options, and along with their physician have decided that they're just gonna stay in atrial fibrillation for the rest of their lives. So based on these different classifications, what I want you to know is the longer you have atrial fibrillation, the harder it is to get you out of atrial fibrillation. So the mantra, atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation, is very important. What are the typical symptoms patients get when they have AFib? A lot of my patients will tell me they'll feel a fish flopping around in their chest, or they will feel drums pounding in their chest. These are all very common. However, the most common symptoms when somebody has atrial fibrillation are the palpitations we just described, dyspnea or shortness of breath, chest discomfort or fatigue. I'll tell you in my own practice, the majority of patients who come to me for treatment of atrial fibrillation will tell me that the fatigue is their worst symptom. Now that we've talked a little bit about symptoms about atrial fibrillation, how do physicians diagnose it? What you can see on your screen here is a 12 lead electrocardiogram or an EKG. And this is a six second snapshot in time where you're at your physician's office or in the emergency room where they're able to look at the electrical activity within the heart. And this shows somebody who has atrial fibrillation at a rapid heart rate. However, what happens if you go to your physician's office, you've been feeling palpitations, they get an EKG and it shows normal rhythm. How can we diagnose it then? As you can see here, there are multiple other ways to monitor for and diagnose atrial fibrillation. There are holter monitors that you can wear for 24 to 48 hours from your doctor's office or the emergency room that allow for diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, especially if it comes and goes. 
If you have atrial fibrillation that is less frequent, your doctor may prescribe something called an event monitor. They can wear up to 30 days. If that's not an option that you like, there are other higher technological options that there are out there. There is a cardiomobile or a cardia device that you can pair with your phone and you can take it whenever you have symptoms. Additionally, Apple Watches have the ability to detect atrial fibrillation that comes and goes. And these are usually higher generation Apple Watches. Also, generation four and above, you're able to take your own ECG and make a PDF and send it to your physician for review if you feel like you are having palpitations. So that way you have it at the ready whenever you need it. So now that we talked a little bit about what atrial fibrillation is, we understand what the symptoms are, let's talk about what are the risk factors? How do we really nail down how to treat atrial fibrillation? When I look at risk factors, I separate them into two general categories as modifiable and non-modifiable, meaning risk factors you can do something about and others you just really can't. The ones you can't really modify are your age, your genetics, your history of heart disease. Those are all things that play a vital role in AFib. Age is probably the most, but the ones we can really concentrate on will hopefully help make your atrial fibrillation a lot more manageable. What are those? They include sleep apnea, obesity, alcohol intake, and stress, whether it's internal stress from infection, like a pneumonia or urinary tract infection, or external stress that we experience as humans every single day. So let's start by talking about sleep apnea. Every patient that comes to see me, I always discuss this with them first. Whether they are overweight or whether they are normal weight, I always recommend that they get a sleep study, especially because if you have sleep apnea by itself and you don't have AFib, your risk of developing atrial fibrillation in your lifetime is three times higher than the general population. In addition to that, if you have atrial fibrillation and you've been on medications and you've had an ablation and you have sleep apnea that's not treated, the likelihood that you'll get atrial fibrillation again, despite going through an invasive cardiovascular procedure, being on medications is 50%. So in order to truly get as close to a cure for AFib as possible, we have to treat these risk factors and the top of that list is sleep apnea. In addition, obesity plays a critical role in the propagation of AFib. As you can see in the heat map, the map on the right basically shows obesity trends within the United States. The areas that have the highest rates of obesity also have the highest rates of atrial fibrillation hospitalization. It is critical for you to discuss ways with your physician on how to acquire a healthy lifestyle, including diet and AHA recommended exercise because physical fitness along with good diet and weight loss are gonna help you hopefully stay out of atrial fibrillation. This is an interesting fact. Stress is a big player in developing atrial fibrillation. We talked about external stress. So again, we're human beings, we can't completely get rid of it. But let's see uh, what's been done in the past. In this study done out of Kansas City, the, all the patients within the study had an AFib ablation. They all had an invasive cardiovascular procedure where their doctors went in and tried to treat their atrial fibrillation. For the first three months, they didn't prescribe any sort of stress reduction. They said, go ahead and live your life, do what you would normally. What they found is a lot of these patients had both symptomatic and asymptomatic episodes of AFib, meaning episodes they'd feel and not feel. So then they also measured the symptomatic and asymptomatic episodes during months three to six. And the only intervention they made during that time was yoga, twice a week for an hour at a time. And what they found is there's a dramatic reduction in overall atrial fibrillation, whether the patient felt it or not. So these are very interesting results in light of treating atrial fibrillation. The other one that I counsel all my patients on, especially if they've had an ablation, or especially if we are treating their atrial fibrillation with medicines, is alcohol intake. All my patients who have difficult to treat atrial fibrillation, that's the one thing I ask about, then I unfortunately have to tell them that the correct answer is as close to zero as possible. The more you drink, if you have atrial fibrillation, the harder it's gonna to be to control it long-term. We've talked about risk factors, we've talked about symptoms, we've talked about diagnosis. Let's get to the part talking about treatment. When we think about treatment of atrial fibrillation, we think about treatment for stroke prevention, 
and treating the actual rhythm to keep you in normal rhythm. Let's start by talking about stroke prevention. You and your physician will review your risk factors and see if you are a candidate for blood thinners. And if you are a candidate for blood thinners, there are four major medicines on the market right now. There is a drug called warfarin or Coumadin that's been out for many years that patients have utilized over time. The upside to utilizing this medicine is it's relatively inexpensive. The downside for utilizing warfarin though are, are many. You have to be very intensive with your therapy. You have to get your blood levels checked initially every week and then eventually once a month by your physician. You have to be very critical on what medicines you're taking and make sure there are no interactions. And you also have to be very, very careful of what you eat and your diet being consistent from day to day to make sure that your warfarin levels within your blood are appropriate. The newer set of blood thinners are called direct oral anticoagulants or used to be called new oral anticoagulants. There are three, and I'm sure you've heard their names on television. They are Pradaxa, Xeralto, and Eloquis. Pradaxa and Eloquis are twice a day. Xeralto is once a day. The upside to taking these medicines are you take the medicine and your blood is thin. There are very few interactions with other medicines and there are few, very few restrictions on taking these drugs. The downside to utilizing these medicines is that they're relatively expensive, but there are ways that your physician could potentially help you reduce the cost of taking these drugs. For patients who need to be on blood thinners or need to have protection from stroke in atrial fibrillation, but they can't take blood thinners because their risk of bleeding is too high, there are alternative options. One, uh, one such option is called a Watchman device. When somebody has atrial fibrillation, that top chamber tries to beat four to 600 times per minute. Well, what happens is it can't do that. And when it tries to form blood clots, those blood clots, as you can see, form in a little nook called the left atrial appendage about 90% of the time. It's a little outpouching that comes off of the top left chamber of the heart called the appendage, and that is where the blood clots form. So again, if you can't take blood thinners, but your risk for stroke is high from atrial fibrillation, your doctor can talk to you about an, a procedure called a watchman, where you, you take a little umbrella-like device, go up into the top left chamber of the heart and cover up that area so that your heart essentially is protected. And after about six months, you're able to get off of all blood thinners potentially. And it keeps your risk for stroke relatively low and you're off of blood thinners. There are other potential options patients can utilize if you can't use the watchman. There are surgical procedures and other invasive procedures as well, but you should talk to your doctor about other options. So now we've talked about stroke prevention. Let's talk about symptom and rhythm control. In this slide, we're talking about rate control. These are great medicines. I'm sure you guys have heard of some of these medicines. The classes are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. Some very common drugs are toprol XL or metoprolol or cardizem or diltiazem. These drugs are not meant to bring you back to normal rhythm. All these drugs do are slow your heart rate down. So rather than being 150 beats per minute, it's 80 beats per minute, but you're still in atrial fibrillation. However, if you want to get back to normal rhythm, there's a class of drugs called antiarrhythmic drugs. These drugs work to various degrees of getting your heart back to normal rhythm. There are six major drugs. I'm gonna just say the name once so you've heard of them. They're flecainide, propafenone, dronetarone, sodalol, difetilide, and amiodarone. You may or may not have been on one of these medications. They all have different indications and they all have different potential side effects. I recommend you talk to your doctor to see if one of these might be right for you. Now, sometimes medications alone are not effective. Sometimes you may need a procedure to get you back to normal rhythm. There are patients who come in with a very rapid heartbeat that is very symptomatic, and you may have to get something called a cardioversion or a shock to get your heart back to normal rhythm. The shock is a great short-term temporizing measure, but it is not a long-term solution. If you want a long-term solution, there is a procedure called an ablation. There are two major types of ablation, one called the radiofrequency ablation and another called a cryoablation. For both of these procedures, your physician will take a catheter 
or catheters from your leg, go up into your heart, cross over to the top left chamber of the heart, and find and isolate those cells where those pulmonary veins come and touch down and touch the top left chamber of the heart and try to keep your atrial fibrillation signals away from your normal conduction system. As you can see, with radiofrequency ablation, there is a force sensing catheter that we utilize to keep the procedure safe for you and effective. This catheter, we're able to isolate these cells very easily, cauterize them, and get rid of them. For a cryoablation, it's a very similar procedure, but rather than using a force sensing catheter that heats, this is a balloon that freezes. So again, a physician takes the catheter from the leg, goes up into the heart, crosses up into the top left chamber of the heart, and they utilize this balloon, and they put this up into the pulmonary vein at the junction of the pulmonary vein in the top left chamber of the heart, and they freeze those cells away, essentially destroying all the abnormal electrical AFib areas. So to conclude, atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm abnormality in the world. Patients are highly symptomatic, and the most common symptoms include palpitations or irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, and fatigue. AFib does increase the risk of stroke, heart failure, and even dementia. Treatment is aimed primarily at preventing stroke and returning the heart back to normal rhythm. Stroke can be prevented with medications called blood thinners, or if you cannot take a blood thinner, you can talk to your doctor about using something called a watchman device or similar devices or surgical techniques to it. Finally, in order to return your heart back to normal rhythm, there are various medications that can be utilized, but the best treatment strategy that we have and the most effective is ablation. Overall, in order to get as close to a cure for atrial fibrillation as possible, it's gonna require teamwork between you and your physician. The best treatment strategy we have is ablation, but that ablation needs to be coupled with risk factor control. As long as you and your physician are in constant dialogue about how to control your atrial fibrillation, hopefully you too can get close to a cure for AFib. I would like to thank you for taking the time for coming to our health chat about atrial fibrillation living with an irregular heartbeat.